Good morning and welcome to Eastminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Presley Cox, pastor here at Eastminster, and we welcome you to worship this morning. No matter who you are or where you are, know that you are welcome to worship with us and that we are united by God's welcoming and loving spirit no matter where we are. If you're watching on Facebook Live, we invite you to comment in the box. To share the peace of Christ with one another, let us know that you are here so that we can respond because we are grateful that you have joined us for worship this morning. All children and youth are invited to come by the church this afternoon between the hour of 4.30 to 5.30. It will be a drive-by popsicle event where you will get a popsicle as well as a backpack tag and a sheet of stickers to serve as a reminder that your Eastminster Church family loves you even while we are apart. Again, that is this afternoon between the hours of 4.30 and 5.30. We hope that you will take time to learn more about the life and ministry here at Eastminster by visiting our website, www.eastminster.com. Please join now in our call to worship as seen on your screen. Come in from the night. It is a new day and this is where love lives. Take off your coat. Let the weight fall off your shoulders, for here you are known, here you are loved. Come in from the rain, we can do anything together, we can survive together. When the world unravels from under your feet, come in, come in. Come in. God is here. You are home. You will never be alone. Let us worship the God who weaves us together. Amen. God, the God revealed to us in the pages of Scripture is a welcoming and inclusive God who directs us to love one another. We seek to remove all the barriers that keep us from that love. Come now to confess all that separates you from others and from God. Let us pray. Holy God, we have been angry because we are suffering and we don't understand. We have been skeptical because we know heartbreak that doesn't seem fair. We have withheld love because sacrifice only feels real when it's our own. Forgive us for not forgetting. Forgive us for forgetting that you created the heavens and the earth. Forgive us for withholding our pain from you. Forgive us for thinking that we know everything. When the world falls apart around us, when the love unravels and the life slowly fails, draw us in. Show us grace, for you gave the wind its weight and you gave our bodies life. Forgive us for forgetting that. Amen. The good news is that Christ called us to new life and enables us to begin again and again and yet again and again. Friends, 
believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Good morning, friends. It is so great to be with you today. I hope you all have had a great week. It is getting to be a busy time of year, and I cannot believe summer is almost over. It feels like it's been such a long time since I've seen you and I miss you. But I want to tell you a little story today, and this story is about questions. And I want to know, do you ever ask questions that start with the word why? Maybe like, why is the sky blue? Or why do birds fly? Or why does it take so long to get to the restaurant? Or why do we have to wait so long for something special to happen? Or maybe if you have a question and you want to ask it, but you have to hold up your hand for such a long time that then you forget your question. Oh, it's so hard. Well, there is a story in the Bible that we're going to hear about today. And it's about a man and his name is Job. And Job had so many why questions for God. Job had suffered a long time in his life. And he had asked God, why do all these bad things happen? Job didn't always find the answers for his questions, but he learned about God's love for him. And he learned that that love was bigger than anything he could imagine. So when I was thinking about that, I thought, what is the biggest thing I can imagine? And I think the biggest thing I can imagine is the ocean. God's love is bigger than that. Can you imagine? Well, if God's love is bigger than the ocean or anything we can imagine in our brain, imagine that. It's okay to ask God our why questions because God loves us no matter what. Well, it also made me think, these questions, that this week something special is going to start happening. And I have a lot of why questions about it. And so Pastor Presley is going to come up here and help me with something. So this week, and we're going to socially distance and stand apart. And Pastor Presley's being really good. She has her mask on. Here's mine. Well, this is one of my why questions. Why do we have to wear these masks when we go to school? Well, we have to wear these masks because we want everybody to be safe. We want you to be safe and your teachers to be safe and your parents to be safe. That's why we have to wear those masks. Well, why is school going to be different this year? Because some of us are going to school in our building. Some of us are going to school only on the computer. Some of us are staying home to go to school. Some of us will take our computer to our daycare and do our schoolwork there. So school is really different. So I think school this year is going to have a lot of questions that are different. Like, why can't we play on the playground the same way? Or why can't we eat in the cafeteria? Or... Why do we have to walk so far apart from our friends? And why can't we hug everybody? That's my biggest question. Well, the thing I want you to remember is no matter how many why questions you have, God is with you at school, whether you're in your school building or at your home or your daycare or on your computer, no matter where you are, God is with us with all these big why questions. And so this Sunday, we would normally be sitting right here together and we would pass out these cool backpack tags. But this year, some people might not have a backpack. So we did something fun and we made sheets of stickers for you that you can stick on folders or books or maybe your water bottle or something special that you're going to use to remember 
that not only does God love you so much, but so does your Eastminster family. So what we're going to do in just a minute is we're going to say a special blessing. And then this afternoon at 430, oh my, you're all invited to come to church and drive through. You get a popsicle and you get a backpack tag and a sheet of stickers. So we're going to start our school year with some fun, even though we have lots of questions. So let's say a prayer together. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for new opportunities to learn and grow, whether it be in an actual classroom, a virtual classroom, or from our homes. Be with our teachers, leaders, caregivers, and administrators as they guide us into the new school year. Give them the tools and energy to create engaging ways for all of us to learn and to grow. Help us to open our hearts and minds to new ideas, new friends and leaders, and new ways of learning. Show us how to seek joy in all things. When things don't go as planned, help us rejoice in the newness. When we have technical difficulties, help us rejoice in simple things like books and crayons. When we feel lonely or isolated, remind us that you are by our side. When our teachers and caregivers seem worried and weary, help them to be gentle with themselves. As we begin to explore the unknown of this school year, let us rejoice with new friends in new ways of learning, in knowing that you are with us through it all. God of joy and light, pour out your blessing upon these children families, teachers, and leaders. Bless their backpacks, their Chromebooks and computers, their virtual classrooms, school buildings, and all preparations that help build a strong and safe year for everyone. May each of you be a blessing and light in your new year. Go and light up the world. Amen. Amen.
before we turn to hear God's word in scripture, let us turn our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning, as we continue our unraveled sermon series, comes from the 28th chapter of Job, verses 12 through 28. Hear now these words. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is this place of understanding? Mortals, do you not know the way to it? And it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed out as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it nor can it be exchanged for the jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to humankind, Truly, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Talk about unraveling. Life doesn't get more unraveled than the story of Job. For those of you not familiar with the life of Job, his story begins almost like a fairy tale. With the words, there once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job that was blameless an upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. It sounds a lot like once upon a time, doesn't it? But like many fairy tales, the story of Job quickly takes a turn. He loses everything. He loses his livestock. He loses his health. He even loses his children. Job suffers greatly, is given terrible advice and care by some of his friends, faces God in a whirlwind. And yet somehow, through all of that unraveling, Job remains faithful. Job remains true. Job continues 
to look for God. It's a hard story to read. It's a hard story of one's life that has become unraveled. Theologian and professor Walter Brueggemann, though, reminds us that the book of Job is theater. It's designed to voice an alternative reality and to invite the listening Israel to reimagine its explanation of reality, which had mostly gone uncriticized. He says, like all good theater, it is aimed at self-awareness that invites us to see our lives afresh from a new and different perspective. I wonder how might Job's story help us to see our lives afresh from a new and different perspective? Job argues that the usual cliches that we live by don't always hold up in life. You know those cliches that I'm talking about, the ones that say if you take good care of yourself, you'll live a good and long life. If you work hard and do what is right, you will receive many blessings in return. If you do good, then it will come back and find you. We know that those ideas work some of the time. But Job's truthful voice says not always. Job reminds us that sometimes our lives, and even as we know it, the world, becomes unraveled. And yet, even with all of that loss, Job didn't curse or blame God. Job's wife tells him to curse God and die. Understandably, as she too has experienced these great losses. So three of Job's friends show up in his story. They show up and upon witnessing his terrible suffering simply sit in silence with him for seven days. Which is a wonderful example of how to care for someone who is grieving. Presence, the act of showing up, is more powerful than any words. But after that silence, Job finally speaks, lamenting, despairing, cursing, not cursing at God, but cursing the day he was born. Perhaps the gift of his friends sitting with him gave him the courage to weep, to speak aloud some of the pain that he was feeling inside. Unfortunately, though, at this point in the story, his friends' good instincts shift a bit. And they end up saying some sort of stupid things, the kind of things you should never say to someone who is suffering. Things like, are you sure there isn't some sin you've committed along the way that is forcing God to punish you? Kate Bowler, in her book, Everything Happens and Other Lies I've Told Myself, reflects on her experience with stage four colon cancer. She reflects on the life lessons that some people tried to teach her in the midst of that suffering. She divided those misplaced lessons into three kinds of people. Minimizers are the people who try to teach her that death isn't the ultimate end. She should therefore stop complaining or searching and just accept the way the world is. She said, secondly, the teachers were the group of people who focused on why this experience was supposed to be an education for her. 
After publishing a reflection in a newspaper, one man wrote to her, I hope you have a Job experience. Bowler writes, I can't think of anything worse to wish on someone, not if you actually know the story of Job. Yet the hardest of the three lessons, Kate Bowler says, came from the solutions people. The people who were always presenting a solutions-focused theology. Bowler says these letter writers are not simply trying to give me something. They are tallying up the sum of my life, sometimes for clues, sometimes for answers, always to pronounce a verdict. But I am not on trial, Bowler reflects. It takes 27 chapters in Job for his friends to realize that he is not on trial. His friends actually start out as models for what to do when someone is suffering. But after those seven days, they turn into the kind of people that Bowler warns us about. Chapter after chapter, they try to explain to Job the possible reasons for his suffering. He must have done something wrong, one says. God is always right, says another. And the third says, even if Job does not know what he has done wrong, God does. Job should just go ahead, say he is sorry, and let God apply the repentance that is required. Our text for today, for today, chapter 28, is a kind of turning point in the story. Job's recognition after much debate and contemplation that wisdom and understanding are simply beyond him in the midst of this unraveling. Where shall wisdom be found, he asked, and where is this place of understanding? Job wants to know when everything unravels, when we are in the midst of deep anguish, when we have overwhelming grief, when the waters have come up to our necks, when we have lost something or someone incredibly dear, lost not just our present, but also our future, when it all just unravels. There is no wisdom to be found. There is no understanding, says Job. Bowler continues in her book and says that the letter writers who gave her the most comfort were never the people trying to teach her the answer to the why questions. They were the people who wrote about who was there in their own suffering. When were you afraid that the end had come, she asked. Were you alone? As one letter writer wrote to Bowler, God was there. An indescribable peace changed him forever. And he said, I have no idea how this works, but I wish this for you as you move forward. In my dream right now for the world that seems to be unraveling before us, with unjust and disease and people constantly fighting with one another. My dream is for a world that has the kind of friends that show up like Job's did at the very beginning. The friends that show up no matter whatever we are going through. Maybe it's the loss of a job, a cancer diagnosis, the death of a loved one, the end of a marriage, 
the drinking that's really hard to stop, or the crippling kind of depression that makes it hard to get out of bed in the morning, or perhaps just the anxiety that is sweeping over all of us these days. My dream is that we could be those kinds of friends to one another, those who know how to sit in the mess, who allow us just to be and remind us of the never-ending fact that we are loved by a God unconditionally. We are loved by a God who defies explanation and keeps showing up. Bowler writes, I can't reconcile the way that the world is jolted by events that are wonderful and terrible, the gorgeous and the tragic, except I am beginning to believe, she says, that these opposites do not cancel each other out. Instead, life is beautiful, yet life is hard. When the story unravels for us, when it really, really falls apart, may we reach for something beyond an explanation also like Job did. May we, and I say this with fear and trembling, May we let ourselves be unraveled all the way back into relationship with God. Wisdom. The wisdom that Job speaks about in this text is asking our questions, knowing we might not get the answers as to why life has unraveled. But understanding is turning to God even in the midst of that, even when our life is unraveling. We continue to go to God, to have faith, and to share that with one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us now affirm what we believe using the affirmation of faith from a sanctified art. I believe in God who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to disregard anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven part of God's self into the fiber of our our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church, and that like the quilt of different fabrics. She is designed to be as diverse and beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, 
to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love, and to invite me into a new journey. Amen. Now let us bring our joys and concerns to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, when the world looks at us, your church, who do they see that you are? We pray that through the testimony of our lives and ministry, others glimpse seeing your goodness and compassion. We hope that indeed the world knows we are your followers by our love. Where we have fallen short of that commandment, forgive us and send your spirit to correct us and transform us. When we attempt to love you and our neighbors, strengthen that urge and embolden our witness. As the summer moves into fall, we admit our weariness with the ongoing threats brought on by this pandemic. We had hoped to be through the worst of this health crisis and all its fallout, moving headlong into the events and transition that mark this time of year. Instead, we continued continue to navigate the troubled waters all around us, unsure when this storm and all the damage it has wrought will come to an end. Quiet our anxious mind, Prince of Peace. Grant us courage for the living of these days. Do not let our faith fail when we need most to put it into practice. We ask for wisdom as we seek to make decisions and act in ways that bring healing and wholeness to the brokenness we feel within and see all around us. As followers of the one through whom all things are possible, give us vivid imaginations for how the difficulties of this time can be used by you to bring good and build communities of mutual care. We voice to you who counts every hair on our head and promises never to abandon us, the concerns we hold near to our hearts this day. Hear our prayers for those closest to us for whom we worry and wonder how to support. Intervene for those farthest away from us, those who we do not know and those we do not want to know, those known only to you. Call us to you now so that we will be drawn together one another and through you made one. A vision on earth of the multitude of tribes and nations united in worship and praise. Make of us rocks upon which your church stands firm, a beacon of light that pro provides warmth, direction, and comfort to the world you so love. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, who taught us to say when we pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, everything belongs to the Lord and yet God gifts us with resources we are to steward and share. Please join us in supporting how God is still alive and working through Eastminster as we celebrate our morning offering. You can give in the following ways as seen on your screen. Mail a check to the church office at 2240 Woodruff Road, Simpsonville, 29681. Online through the website on your screen or text Eastminster to 73256. For gifts of all shapes and sizes, we give thanks to our God. Let us pray. Receive these gifts we offer, O God. Receive the gifts of our lives. 
from the smallest to the largest. Bless them all to your transforming work in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Look for the joy and be compassionate. And honor all people. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.